today's talk, the uh, uh, hand-to-mouth, hand the, the tools that feed us. And I, I, I want to ask you, how, who knows the last time that there was a vegetable garden on the White House lawn? Anybody know? This year. No, well, that's the last time, but before that, last, last one before Michelle's uh, Let's Move campaign. It was the Second World War? Yes, and who was President? Roosevelt. Roosevelt. Yeah, Eleanor Roosevelt. It was Eleanor Roosevelt's garden. And I want you to pay a particular attention. The word victory garden had been revived from World War I. It was part of the Camp the Kaiser campaign. It was reintroduced in World War II. And in 1944, it peaked under the slogan, Grow More in 1944, brought to you by the Texaco Corporation. And in 1944, 44% of all the fresh fruits and vegetables harvested in this country were grown in 20 million gardeners. Many of the gardeners, amateurs, 60% of the population was involved in food production. That is an astonishing figure. Yeah. Now since then, actually right after, right after VJ Day, a lot of those gardens were, were turned back into lawns. And there was actually something of a little food shortage immediately after the war because all of a sudden the amateurs said, well, we don't have to do this anymore. And it got steadily worse until, you know, somewhere between 1% and 2% of the population today is involved in primary food production. Now, the good news is enormously efficient, these huge tractors plowing, plowing to the horizon and then turning around and coming back in time for dinner. And, and now they're, they're guided by GPS systems and they're all, the person on board the tractor is more or less just there to make sure something doesn't stall out and go out of muck. The, the um, good news is that food has never been cheaper. And the bad news is that the food is so damn cheap. I mean, you get what you pay for, ladies and gentlemen. And in terms of flavor, in terms of nutrition, um, all sorts of issues, there's been some you know, serious decline in that which we get to eat. And furthermore, not only have we, have we lost something in terms of, of flavor and nutrition, but we are in danger of losing the very wisdom of what it takes to feed ourselves. As I've said for years and years, the greatest skill that humans have ever come up with is the knowledge of how to harvest photosynthesis for human benefit. And that's what, what gardeners do. Okay. So the good news, I mean, that's the bad news. The good news is that um, the pendulum is beginning, beginning, I say, to swing the other way. We have wonderful school gardening programs. They're more common in California, where the school year and the gardening year overlap, than here in, in New England. But, but, but school children are learning you know, what a carrot looks like in the ground. And they're, they're, they're learning to eat their carrots with mud still attached, because after all, they pulled it out of the ground, so who needs to wash it? They, um, so we are, we are educating the, good on, uh, the children on, on, on primary sources of food. We have, we have farmers markets galore. We've got CSAs, they're, they're almost 10,000 each. And so they're a huge, huge interest in, in, in food mileage and local board. You heard about that earlier today. The, the, um, this, it's, it's way different. It's way different than when, when I was, was young. Even, even, even surprisingly large grocery stores are labeling you know, Massachusetts grown, Vermont grown, New Hampshire grown, local, this and that, and, and making a point of identifying of that produce which they're getting, not from Chile or from uh, California, the Imperial Valley or whatever, but, but here in New England. And that's, that's all to the good. But um, there's nothing like a great recession to promote individuals to grow their own vegetables. And, and as I have said, that, that recycling is wonderful, but non-use and reuse are superior to recycling. And I, 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 I point out that restaurants serving fancy vegetables in fancy ways, that's wonderful. But if the chef of that restaurant is not charging three times as much as the ingredients cost, that chef is going, or that restaurant is going out of business. And being a cheap Yankee, <laughs> Raising it yourself is the cheapest way to access really, really fine food in abundance. So what I, what I thought, um, um, and I'll give you some statistics, because I tell you that the, the, great, the great recession was excellent. Uh, from 2008 to 2009, in that year, the number of the percentage of 
households that said they were growing vegetables left from 23 to 27%. And 27% works out to about 32 million gardens. 32 million versus 20 million in World War II. That's a pretty impressive number. In theory, in theory, um, we ought uh, to be growing a lot of food. And, and if you don't, and that household garden may be in your backyard. It may be in somebody else's front yard. I've, I've argued for years, if you have, a, if you have a, a, shady, a shady yard or a condominium association that forbids raising vegetables anywhere near your condominium, go down the street and find somebody who has a sunny yard knock on the door and say, you know, I'll share the harvest with you. If you're planting zucchini, you can give them 90%. <laughs> <laughs> That, that, um, so I don't really care, care where you, where you, you plant. There's a, there's a, um, there's a fabulous increase, and we've got a hundred varieties of, of heirloom tomatoes here. This, this, this diversity did not exist, you know, prior to groups like the, the Seed Savers Exchange in Decor, Iowa, and, and uh, other, other groups that have, have Baker Creek, you've already heard about Baker Creek, combing the world for, for the, the oddball stuff and bringing it back and, and there's a fantastic amount. Not just, not just in the diversity of tomatoes, entire, entire new crops. There are things like you know, cilantro and, and, uh, and lemongrass and mashiche, which is the Brazilian word for West Indian gherkin. These foods were not in my father's dietary. <laughs> he didn't like to eat garlic. Garlic was, and, and for that matter, broccoli really only caught on uh, in, in the US after World War II. Uh, so, so every every wave of immigrants, there's a, there, there are there are Hmong gardeners who who are setting up the USDA is helping them helping them set up a farm uh, booths at, at farmers markets and, and someone there speaks good enough English to explain how the heck you eat uh, the, the ends of squash vines um, and um, you know, when it comes to, to immigrants I you know. Give me, give me a hundred ethnic groups because each of them has their own, their own dietary, and they'll introduce me to all kinds of cool stuff. And, and so the richness of our cuisine continues to expand with each wave, with each wave of immigration. If you want to see a neat website, Frank Mangan. Frank Mangan is a professor at, at UMass Amherst, and he runs a website called WorldCrops.org. You can, you, it's about the only thing you need to write down today. It's WorldCrops.org, and he. He goes around the world looking for crops that would grow here in New England, and the people who eat these crops, and he brings in graduate students from these countries, and sets up marketing and distribution programs, and, and you go to that site and you'll, you can click on a map of the world, and up will come the vegetables, and up will come the recipes, and it's, it's, quite, it's quite cool. I was gonna bring you a basket of such, but then it's still going to kind of interfere, so you have to go to the website. Um, but though the number of home gardens, as I say, is, is nearly double what it was in World War II, um, I gotta tell you that the size of the home vegetable garden continues to shrink. And, and uh, it's measured periodically by the Gallup organization in the National Gardeners Association. <laughs> and you know, it was 100 square feet the last time I looked, it's now down to 75. 75 square feet. We have all been, ladies and gentlemen, to salad bars that were way bigger than 75 square feet. <laughs> and, and if you use as a rule of thumb that a, that a square foot of, of a garden will produce half a pound of vegetables per, per square foot per season, you know, you're talking a dollar's worth of vegetables, 30, $35 worth of, you know, it's, it's not, it's not, not a lot of calories in that. And not a lot. Not a lot of calories in that. And um, I, I uh, there's good reasons. I, I can't fault. I can't fault people who who decide that they they tried it and really really they don't have enough time. They they got to get the kids. They got to get the kids to to field hockey practice or or chorus or or whatever and they. They, the demands on people's time seem to expand every time you turn around. The, 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 um, in some cases, it, it is a lack of available space. Those who want to grow a lot of stuff, you know, the young people who aspire to grow production levels and sell them to other people, 
can't afford to buy the land that they need to use. And, and if they borrow it, they don't want to put a lot of investment in it because unless they're sure that they've got some sort of long-term access to it because otherwise they get kicked off because the owner decides they don't like their looks or whatever. So there, there, there are a lot of people working very hard to, to, to pair young, young growers with landowners of large fields that they're not currently using. And, and things, things can be done, but it's a challenge. The, the, what the land sells for, for development rights is so much higher than it's worth for agriculture that it's hard to pair up young gardeners in, in the land. The, the, there's a need, and there's a lot of talk about sustainable agriculture, ladies and gentlemen, but as Trauger Grow, who was a co-founder of, of one of the first two CSAs on this continent, Trauger Grow said it is not sustainable if at the end of his or her career, the gardener doesn't have enough money to retire on. And, the, and, 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 and people pour their money back in, they make money and they pour it back into their operation. And when you get to the end of your working career, what do you do? And all too often you end up selling the farm because the only way you've got to have enough money for your really old age is by liquidating something and that's how farms die. And so there, when I came up through the ranks as a teenager in New Hampshire, went to a lot of twilight meetings and they'd say, fine, put in an acre of grapes, duh, 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 duh. You know, you'll make a portion of your income doing this and you do good things for the land, but do not give up your day job. Because it's your day job that pays you a disproportionately high amount of money per hour of work and with which you may get a pension or a retirement account or some kind of money. There's, there's, there's nothing wrong with learning with learning to garden when you're young, but it's probably not going to be. I mean, I didn't see a whole lot of hands go up today when you were asked how many people make them are primarily vegetable growers. And, and, and I don't. I'm primarily a teacher and an editor and a writer. And the last reason that people give it up is it's hard work. There's, there's no getting around it. It's hard work. It, the days are long. The, 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 our bodies do get tired. Um, so, and yet, as Michael Pollan, you remember Michael Pollan's the first, the first words in his defense of, of food, uh, an eater's manifesto was, you know, eat food, mostly plants, not too much. This is what we need to do, really, to live and to live well. So eat food. You can put the word real in if you want. Just eat real food, mostly plants, not too much. And so I'm going to come up with a, I'm going to come up with a, with a novel, a novel proposal. And that is, there's a lot of talk about training a generation of young farmers, bringing young people in. It's wonderful. It's wonderful that, that, that sons and daughters-in-law and this and that get to join the family farm and, and do this. But these, these are fairly rare circumstances in which you have a multi-generational farm that doesn't always, transfers don't always work that smoothly. And and I say to young farmers, I've just told you, I say to young farmers, um, get yourself a day job too. Kind of nice, my, 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 my late wife used to love going to her office as a dean at Harvard because it was a break from the weekend. <laughs> she'd work her butt off for two and a half days and then God, she gets to the office and whew, you know, she could sit down all day long. She could sit down and the only muscle she had to use was up here. And when she retired, it was all of a sudden, you know, seven days of work a week, but but my segue is as follows, and, and it just it occurred to me late yesterday afternoon. She was not a trained horticulturist. She, she liked raising apples, and she, uh, we, we gardened together f for many years, starting first on the weekends, and then, and then seven years after she retired. But she was a, an Italian Renaissance historian. Uh, she, she, studied, she studied 15th century Italian family correspondence, and, and, and one year she got a, an all-expense-paid sabbatical to Italy, and she lived lived free of charge in, in, right there in, in, in downtown Florence. And she was amazed by the number of women pushing strollers who were not young. 
And at the time, there'd been recent medical news that through the injection of hormones into postmenopausal women, it was possible to get pregnant. And she said, wow, who knew? I mean, she, she read the New York Times article, but she gets there and she goes, Jesus, there are a lot of women taking advantage of this technology. And then it took her a while to realize that was not what was happening at all. <laughs> what she was looking at were grandmothers <laughs> pushing the strollers. Actually, some of them fairly young grandmothers, but they were grandmothers, not old mothers. In Italy, and maybe it's changed a little bit since then, my data dates back from, from, from the early 80s, men and women worked full time had children, but the children were raised by their parents. And every woman got a chance to raise an infant up to through, through a high school, but they were raising their grandchildren, not their children. And it kept people living in the same town, it kept families together, there were all kinds of, she was studying economics, it worked. It, it worked. And so what I, what I suddenly occurred to me as I say, um, when I thought about this, is that, um, is that, uh, that now in the year of my own retirement, I've just, I've just turned, I'll turn 66 next week. And that what we might be thinking about are the opportunities presented to the older vegetable gardener. And, and demographically, most of us who, who reach 66 have another 20 years. 20 years is a lot of time. Maybe we're not going to be as vigorous as, as suddenly I am right now. <laughs> but for 10 years I might be. And 10 years is, is a lot of seasons. There's 40 some seasons. And I, 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 I've always argued that there is really no excuse not to garden. There was in my town an, an incident uh, the year before last in which an elderly woman up, fell down in her garden, and her daughter called and didn't get didn't get any answer. And this net called up the rescue service. The rescue service did, did a well person checkup kind of thing. They found this woman sprawled in her garden. And although the rescue chief said that she was a little dehydrated and a little bit upset, she had clearly weeded everything within reach while she was down. <laughs> <laughs> Point number one. Point number two. My friend Fletcher Wasson, the man who, who I competed against as a young teenager in county fairs, and Fletcher had this huge collection of potatoes, and he'd show up with 45 kinds of potatoes, and, and it was hard to beat him on, on sheer number because he started with such a great collection of potatoes that he saved year after year. Fletcher was easily in his, in his 80s, and after we got to know each other, he invited me to his farm, which must have been, he probably had half an acre of vegetables that he was still maintaining in his 80s, and he had a, he had a rotor tiller. But he'd done an interesting thing. He connected a string on his belt to the rotor tiller, and he said, he said, at my age, I fall down a lot, and when I fall down, the string pulls on the motor until the switch and it shuts off. And he said, that way it doesn't chew up a whole roll of beans every time I fall down. <laughs> this is adaptive technology, okay? <laughs> now, what I'm going to talk about are hand tools. I'm going to talk about hand tools um, because when land is scarce, and you've certainly seen some examples of, of countries in which Arable land is in short supply. When land is scarce, you want to do intensive gardening. You want to, you want to grow things not in long, thin rows, but you want to grow them in, in what some people call square foot gardening, and other call French intensive, or whatever. It's been invented by culture after culture after culture, but basically, you, you put the plants the optimum distance from their neighbor, and you keep your paths as small as possible, and you get tremendous yields, particularly if you cycle one crop after another into the same space, which which Jack here is doing with his greenhouses. And, and to be honest, we don't need any more global warming, ladies and gentlemen. We got enough internal combustion exhaust warming, warming the planet up. The nice thing about a hoe is that if you fall down in the garden, your hoe stops. <laughs> and if it's a long handle hoe, it comes in handy on getting you up to your feet again. It's a useful stick. Okay. So what I, what I, um, and, and my late wife Elizabeth, I wish she was here because 
I would, I would, I would ask her to explain this to you. Uh, she was refused to take all the hormones they give you post-menopause, and they said, but you know, you're at risk of osteoporosis. We will have to examine your bones every six months. And they did. And in the next seven years, every time they measured her bone density, it was stronger than it had been before. And there was actually a very detailed medical study on women with all kinds of exercise regimens, people who lifted weights and swam and, and did, did Pilates or, or whatever. And as, as almost as an afterthought, they threw in gardening. And much to their amazement, gardening blew away every other exercise routine out there when it comes to bone density. Elizabeth had a simple explanation for that because, because she said when you're, when you're down on your knees spinning carrots, you don't stop when you've done 10 repetitions. <laughs> you keep going till you get to the end of the row. And so she said, you go this identity or I'm going to finish the carrots. And, and uh, you know, the sun is set and it's growing dark before she sags into the house. But boy, that builds, that builds strong, strong bodies. Oh, one, one, one hand over hand in the garden. And so, so um, I've selected here. I've selected, that's my, my penalty here. That, does that adequately summarize the state of the end here? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I've selected seven tools. Seven tools, um, one I like to say for each day of the week. Um, these seven, with these seven tools, you can do almost all your gardening. Um, and maybe they're, they're one tool for each of Michael Pollan's seven words to live by, eat food, mostly plants, not too much. That adds up to seven as well. So, um, I, like to, I like to begin, I like to begin with, with, um, with the simple observation that any tool should fit your body, your hand, and your need. And that is a very personal decision. That this is, it's impossible for one size or, or one shape to fit everybody. And, the, the, and, the, and when we're done with this conversation, I hope you, 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 you view your connection to your tools a way, way more intimately. I mean, there's, when, when, when Yo-Yo Ma or, or, or Tiger Woods or, or she, He's toast now, but pick, pick any celebrity, <laughs> pick any celebrity sports figure you want. You know, when you and your mom gets ready to, to play the cello, does he say to the cellist next to him, buddy, buddy, you got a bow I can borrow? No. No, they got their own tools. And you should you should have your own tools too, because that is the tool that fits you in all these three ways, your body, your gender, your hand, your knee. Okay. And um, after I finish this talk, somebody's going to come up to me and say, oh, thanks a lot, Mr. Swain. Now I have to buy my wife or my husband a whole new set of tools. And I'm going to tell you what I, I say every time anybody does this, I say, oh, suck it up, come here. <laughs> because uh, these seven tools at the top of the line aren't going to cost you 300 bucks and you can't buy a set of golf clubs for 300 bucks or a set of skills or anything else and, and these tools uh, will last you a lifetime and beyond um, let's begin let's begin with the long handle tools um, Charles W. Warner the American humorist once said what every gardener needs is a cast iron back with a hinge in it and the nice thing about long handled tools is they extend our reach and they extend leverage. And um, I'm going to take them in order of garden construction. The Victory Garden, you watch that television show, made 500 episodes. We had raised beds. But as Kip Anderson, the gardener, would explain, he said, Roger, Roger, we don't have raised beds. We have sunken paths. <laughs> and the way we created those sunken paths, Venice-like, was to take a shovel and dig the soil out 
of the aisles and throw them on the bed. A raised bed, a raised bed, there are so many things in a raised bed, one of them more, it dries out faster in the spring, and because it dries out faster, it warms up faster, it gives you increased soil profile, holds more moisture, and you don't have to bend over so far to pick the stuff, okay? But, but a good shovel, this shovel is made by the Ames Tool Company. And the Ames Tool Company makes shovels in 10 grades. And only the cheapest three grades ever make it into a place like Home Cheapo. You want, this is the top of the line. This is the pony shovel. And the pony shovel is, is, is the most expensive shovel in the bunch. But 50 bucks will get to a pony shovel. So why do you want to buy a shovel for $19.95? Uh, and, and, and a shovel is a, a shovel is probably the premier gardening tool for beginning a garden because a shovel is a tool used for moving something from point A to point B. I don't care whether you're moving manure, or moving sand, or, 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 or moving soil to build raised beds. Uh, a shovel is peculiar because it has three properties to it. It has, it has a curve there called crank, and then the blade goes up like that, that's called lift, and then this curvature here called dish. And crank, lift, and dish determine the function of the shovel. What you do is you put it down like that, you stand on it, you push it into the ground, you pull it back, tremendous leverage. Do you remember what Archimedes said? What did Archimedes say? Give me a place to stand and I can move the world. And all of us who have ever used a good crowbar know that you can stand on the lever. You don't have to have a place to stand, you just jump up and down on the crowbar and you'll move that rock eventually. The, uh, so you stick it in the ground, you pull it back, you lift up, and what? The load is now level and the load is cupped by the curvature of the blade, and you can carry it wherever you want, and you can dump it. This is how we build beds. Now, some of you like beds edged in board, some of you like beds edged in concrete, if you're Myanmar. Um, we edged our beds with gravity. Gravity actually holds the soil up quite well. The, um, now, this is a, you come up afterwards and you hold this, and you go, that's a, that's a, that's a heavy shovel. So I bought my mother's shovel. <laughs> it's called officially a floral shovel. And it's got a, a six inch blade instead of a nine inch blade. And most of my 93 year old mother's tools have orange tape wrapped around, which is keep your damn hands off my shovel. Because <laughs> it's mine and you'll break it. It's not designed for, for heavy work. This shovel is virtually impossible to break. The, the, now the problem with this shovel is the handle is too short. But then my mother is shorter too. You, the older you get, the more your spine compresses, the shorter you become. This will be just fine when I'm 90 years old. <laughs> this one here, which is higher up, is the right, the right height for, for me now. So those of you who, who, who are, are perennial gardeners and, and this and that at one time or another have, have opened up these lovely books of, of fine, fine English gardens. And they're, they're really cheap and they're beautifully illustrated. And, and surely, you know, surely you could have an English garden in Vermont. <laughs> Not, but but you can try. But you read the text, and they're always talking about spades, spade this and spade that. And Americans don't talk so much about spades. They talk about shovels. So the question is, what's a shovel and what's a spade? So I bought you a spade. Okay, a spade. A spade is quite different. First of all, it has almost no dish, and it it, it has a little crank, but not much lift. It's a much it's a much more linear blade. A spade is a tool used once you have an established garden. It's great for edging. You try to edge with a shovel and you wind up with an edge that goes like this. Right? You can't edge a straight line with a shovel, but you can edge a straight line with a spade. Now, this tool is invaluable when it comes to you know, keeping the, the, restoring the edge or dividing dailies with things like that. It's way less useful in vegetable culture. We, we, simply, we have very few perennials that would require the use of a spade to divide them. Uh, and it's, it is, as they say in Boston, flat ass useless <laughs> when it comes to shoveling anything from anywhere because you dig it out, you lift up, you hold it, and everything falls off the blade. So, so this is a spade, this is a shovel. Okay? You got any, any, and, and if you're confused, if you're confused, and any of you have enough money to squander, and want to go to Foxwoods and he can sign. <laughs> and the dealer hands you one of these, 
What have you got? No. Right, this is the ace of shovel. I have no idea who named it the ace of spades. This is an ace of shovels. It's way closer to it's way closer to the shovel blade than it is to a spade. Okay, so please correct this. <laughs> off gamble, all right? Now, a word about shock risk. We all understand the importance of shock pruning tools and shock saws and this and that, and very few of you understand the merits of a shock spade or a shock shovel for that matter. So I'm going to show you because it's a whole lot less work if the blade is sharp. You don't have to push nearly as hard. You don't have to jump on it. it it'll slide through the soil. Yes, here in New England, it will hit a rock. And it will get dull. And you will need to sharpen again. So this is how you do it. You go to your hardware store and you say, I need a 10-inch bastard mill file. And the bastard refers to the coarseness, and the mill refers to the fact that it's only a single line of grooves. The file is obvious if you want to have fun, walk into the hardware store and say, give me a 10 inch bastard. <laughs> Somebody go, whoa, whoa, did you hear what that man said? <laughs> but a good hardware man or woman will hand you this file. This is the tool that machinists use for the quick removal of metal. And you clamp, you clamp, you can do this with a bench grinder, but you can do it in the field, same way that the people mowing with a side would keep, um, keep a uh, stone in their back pocket. The stroke is called a toe-to-heel stroke. You start at one edge of the blade, and you go like that. If you go like this, you will make a notch in the saw blade, in, in, the, in the spade blade. If you go like this, you will make a notch in the file. You don't want to make a notch in either one. You want to start at one edge and finish up at the other. And if you were looking closely here, you'd see fine iron filings coming off the blade. Now, people say to me, my Lord Roger, this is a $60 spade fully socketed, beautiful thing, English made, and you're gonna, you're gonna file it every time it gets dull. You're gonna, I'm gonna, you're gonna wear it down to nothing. So I will make that offer to you, this is the same offer I've made for years. Bring me, bring me a spade that is down to less than three inches of metal and I will buy you a new one. <laughs> it ain't gonna happen, my money is very safe, okay? But as I say to people, take a break. You know, machines, the thing about rototillers, you've all done it. If you don't own a rototiller, because they're expensive, and you only use them in the spring and in the fall, so you go down to your local tool rental company, and you get a half-day rental on the thing, and you bring it home, and you try to do the whole job in a half-day, or you and your neighbor have got a half-day on it, and so you work for two hours in your yard, you rush over to his or her yard, and you, you rototill like crazy. Who's working for who? You're racing around behind this machine trying to get maximum value out of it. The nice thing about shovels and spades and other hand tools is that they start readily. You know, not, not a lot of pulling. And you can stop and breathe, and it didn't cost you anything. And you can regroup, and you can listen to the birds, and you can stand up straight for a change. And, and as I say to people, time spent filing comes back to you in spades. <laughs> <laughs> so there is a tool. I have less use of the spade, but I have a lot of use for this. This, I think, if I had to go to some island where there was no access to anything else and I was allowed to take one tool, the spading fork is the tool that I take with me. And the spading fork is the newest tool. In all the tools I'm going to show you today, the spading fork is the youngest. 1851. A man named Henry Bessemer, some of you, you know, studying the history of American you know, steel, you know, Bessemer converters, and that, that Henry Bessemer. Teaming up with a man named Alexander Parks, they come up with a new steel alloy that is both strong and flexible. And in 1851, at the Great London Exhibition, they show off the first spading fork to thunderous applause. <laughs> Some of you missed the sesquicentennial of the spading fork in 2001. I can't believe you didn't celebrate this. You went to the party. party. Um, the, it is distinguished from the English border fork, which has square tines. This has triangular, triangular tines. Yes, you can bend these tines. If you use the spading fork to pry out rocks, they will get bent, and it's all impossible to get them back to complete straightness. 
But when it comes to digging sweet potatoes or things like that, this is the tool you want to use. This is the tool that you use to add soil amendments. This is much gentler than a rototiller, and it's superb at locating rocks and this and that, steel fingers that go down and go down in the ground. If you if you if you simply want to open up the, the ground the way you would with a broad fork to, to let in oxygen and dry the ground out without without inverting the soil profile, this is the tool that you use to do it, and it's also good for whaling on woodchucks and other things like that. It's, it's, a, it's an all-purpose, and, and it's called a spade fork because, in fact, it's fork-like, but if you look at the profile, it matches the profile of the spade. Same dish, same crank, same lift. Now, so, you build your, your, raised, your raised beds, you, you um, incorporate wonderful amounts of organic matter or lime. I come from part of the world where they, they call me lime man in the Midwest because I'm always traveling around in a haze of ground limestone because we have to do that because the, our, our pH in, in New Hampshire is perfect for growing blueberries. Yeah. That's you know, about the pH of orange juice. Uh, I also come from part of the world that has 11 months of winter and six weeks of bad skiing. So <laughs> it's challenging. I come here to how sweet, how sweet the soils are in Vermont and your summers are warm and lovely and you can grow fine, fine things. But of course, I go out to the Midwest and people say to me, oh, Mr. Swain, if we had soils like yours, we could grow great vegetables too. And I go, why did your family leave New England to go to Illinois exactly? <laughs> <laughs> so um, you, 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 you stir everything up, you plow everything up, and then you need to smooth it out. Okay? And for that, and for that you, need, you need a rake, the same way that I need a comb. And basically, uh, a, 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 a rake is the tool with the longest handle. The, a, a rake should be at least as tall as you are, and, and in the case of those lovely hay rakes with the wooden tines, you know, it should be a, a hand higher than your head. Because it's a lightweight tool, you know, it goes way out, and you, you bring it all the way back. Now this one here um, is, is, has, um, it's called a bow rake. And the bow is important. There's a reason for this bow. Because the bow uh, is the shuffle hook. That unless your soils are, are, are way, way better than my soils, you will find in any new garden that you have roots and rocks on which you can hook one of the tines. And if you do, there's a little give. There's a little give to this rake. Whereas the landscape rake, which is really only used by people putting in lawns who want to get an absolutely perfect finished grain, this is a much cheaper rake. It has no bow. But the sheds of America are filled with half landscape rakes where a whole section of the rake has broken right off, okay? And that won't happen. And you know, the difference is this is, a, this is a, a $25 rake and this is a $35 rake. This is the rake you want to buy. Oh, one, one, one additional point. If you're gonna spend really good money, say, on a, on a, on a, on a shelter with a long handle, there's something, there's a, boy, the, the cool stuff. Our, our grandparents knew all kinds of stuff that we have completely forgotten, such as, and, and, and if you don't like your, your handle length or your handle size, um, and for handle size, the rule of thumb is that when you grab your handle, your middle finger should just touch the fat of the thumb pad. That's, that's the grip. And baseball players have their bats custom turned for them by the Louisville Slugger Company. And then they, they arrive and then they start scraping and sanding and, and really, really tailoring them to their grip the same way that golfers have their golf clubs fine-tuned to their needs. And in any socket tool where the, where the handle goes down to the socket, you can, you can grind out the, the rivet and put a new handle in of any size or shape that you want. People used to sell axe heads because not everybody could forge an axe head, but every woodsman was expected to make their own handle. Duh. You know, who would tell you how an axe handle should be shaped? That was your own personal preference, the same way that in the tropics, the, the first thing that machete buyers do is take out the plastic handle that it comes with and put their own handle in. Um, but here's an interesting rule of thumb. If you look at this handle, you will see that at, at the side here where it flares out a bit, the grain has run out. You see that little, little circle of grain? That's called the rows. And there's one on each side, or it should be on each side. That is, the roses should face this way, which means that the plane of the grain is this way. And when the plane of the grain is this way, instead of this way, you have a 40% stronger handle. Cool, huh? 
This is irrelevant if you're using a steel or fiberglass handle, but those are both terribly uncomfortable on the hand. The wood handle is a much more comfortable grip. But be, just be sure to check when you're buying a good tool. Look at the grain, make sure the grain runs clean all the way down the handle, and make sure that the roses are to the side. That should be worth the price of admission right there. <laughs> so you are prepared, you have done. You know, as I say, the planting is easy. It's the soil preparation that will kill you. You've done your digging, and you've done your incorporating, and you've done your raking out. Now you have a smooth seed bed. And you plant your seeds, or your little transplants. And what's the first thing to come up with? Yeah, weeds. 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 Weeds grow so much better. Weeds grow so much better than anything, than anything we plant. So this brings us to that tool, which has evolved to a greater diversity than any other gardening tool out there. There's some 1,850 named hoes, apparently. I, I can't catalog them all, but I read that somewhere in English publication. They found 1,850 hoes. The oldest tool, and, and, and I, I need to see it because we saw some pictures of potato fields. And this tool here predates the shod foot. This tool here is the oldest agricultural implement after the pointed stick. It's called an eye hoe. And it's a, it's a heavy blade with, a, with an eye in it. And grub hoes and mattocks and adzes are all eye hoes, with which the handle goes through the blade. And this tool is actually a digging tool. Because unlike the shovel, which you need to stand on to push into the ground, this simply operates on the leverage provided by the handle. You lift it up, swing it over your head, stick it into the ground, pull it toward you, move over one more stroke, pull it toward you. you you're either hilling your potatoes or making a furrow to plant your potatoes. I have watched Indian peasants you know, working entire hillsides with, with a shorter handled version of, of the eye. This is a useless tool for the task in question, which is weeding. For the simple reason that you don't want to disturb soil. The single worst tool ever invented for controlling weeds is the rototiller. The rototiller wipes out all the, the weed seedlings and plants another batch because it brings up seed from the soil bank to the surface, and once those seeds are exposed to sunlight and to warmth, they germinate. As long as they are down a ways, they remain dormant, and they may remain dormant for 100 years, but ready to grow when they get into that position. That's how mulch works. Mulch convinces the seeds on the surface that they're actually deeper in the ground. That's why the, the rice straw mulch that, that you were mentioning, Howard, uh, works. The seeds are there, but they're not going to germinate as long as they are shaded. And the way to think about the right way to weed is to look at the Chinese pictogram for weed. And if you know that the Chinese characters are made up of subunits, for example, the, the, the roof with two women underneath it, that's trouble. <laughs> sexist and offensive, but I didn't make it up. This character has made of three parts. The, 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 the top part is a highly stylized character for plant. The line is to cover, and underneath that, that hook that looks like the bolo tied on a rototiller is knife. A plant covering a knife, that is a weed. I.e., the way to control weeds is to run that knife blade right under the plant. And if Elizabeth were here, I'd say, Elizabeth, what's the secret of weeding? And she'd say, infanticide. <laughs> Kill them when they're young. Or, or just come across a lovely poem which I have committed to memory. It is from the New England Farmer, Volume 8, published in Boston in 1929. Since the best way of weeding is to prevent weeds from seeding, the least procrastination of any operation to prevent the dissemination of noxious vegetation is a source of tribulation. And this, in fact, this in truth, a fact is which gardeners ought to practice until it should remember from April to December. That, 
You, there is, I've said over and over again, the finest fertilizer is the garden of shadow. There's no substitute for being out there when the weeds are just breaking the surface. That's the time you want to cultivate. And what you want to do is move soil very little, undercut the weeds, and there are three kinds of tools to do this with. There are draw hose, oscillating hose, and push hose. Now the draw hoe, you know, so this, is an, this is an onion hoe, and, and it, it's called a draw hoe because you're going to pull it toward you as, as you use it. You, you draw it draw it toward you, and the cutting edge is down here. Now, there are, there are better versions of the draw hoe, and, and Elliot Coleman, who has been mentioned before today, Elliot Coleman reintroduced the collinear hoe, which is essentially looks like a butter knife on a stick. In this particular one, you can interchange the, the knife blade when it gets too dull or, or worn out from sharpening. And the important thing about a hoe is that it should go between your shoulder and your nose for length. And the weird thing is, handles have been getting shorter and people have been getting taller. The UPS shipping code affects the cost of shipping things of various lengths and so people have been putting shorter and shorter handles on the tools and we've been getting taller and taller. The right way to use this tool is to pretend that you are dancing. You hold it with your thumbs up. You pull it toward you, that's the sharp part. You can do twirls and you, whatever you want with it, but, but it's, it's, it's like this. If the handle is only this long, you are hunched over. And, and, and this is as bad for your back as using, using a, an eye hoe to, 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 to what is known as whale and flail. You know, the bent over, wailing and flailing, not only is it a terrible way to weed, but the posture was brought to you by the American Chiropractic Association. You watch, I was trained as an ice dancer, you want to keep your shoulders over your hips and hips over your ankles, and you keep your arms up in front of you as though in dance position, and you know, you're allowed to look down, but you're drawing it toward you, and you are, and you do the weeding, ladies and gentlemen, you do the weeding in the morning of a sunny day. You don't do it at 4.30 in the afternoon when it's going to rain. Because by morning, those weeds will have rerouted themselves and they'll be doing just fine. You, you, want, you, want, to, you want them to desiccate and die before the evening dew falls them. Now, so this is, this is the draw hoe. There is a hoe called a push hoe. And the push hoe, the English call this a Dutch hoe. Which really, the word Dutch in the English gardening literature refers to foreign. This is a foreign hoe. They refer to syphilis as the French disease. <laughs> okay, it's not us, it's them. And the, and the push hoe operates with the thumbs down. And it goes like this. Okay? Now why would you want to do this? Not much reason in the vegetable garden to do this, but if you're trying to kill weeds underneath a, 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 a grapefruit tree or a, or a holly bush that's spiny and you don't want to be in close, you can, you can stand way out of the drip line and go like this and, and shuffle up the weeds that come up through the bush. Okay? So, just for c completeness sake, I brought you a push hoe. I prefer pull hoes. But the hoe I really, really like, the great hoe, a fabulous hoe. This is one. Everybody know this hoe? Sometimes called the action hoe, the reciprocating hoe, the oscillating hoe. The wiggle is important because you want it to dig into the ground a little bit. And if you're going forward, it's got to fall back. And if you come backwards, it's got to fall forward. And you hold, as I said, the push hoe is thumbs down, the pull hoe is thumbs up, the oscillating hoe is thumbs down again. You go like this. And this, you can, you can read backwards and forwards as well as you can walk. And the beautiful thing about it, I mean, this is a snowstorm. We have a snowstorm going out there today, ladies and gentlemen. A good plow blade has a couple fiberglass rods at the edge of the blade to show you where the edge of the blade is so you don't take out the mailbox, etc., in deep snow. The wonderful thing about this particular blade is sharpened at both edges, but again, you can see where the edge of the blade is. So it's hard to undercut the bean plant because you can see where the edge of the blade is. And you can get this in various sizes. Johnny's catalog sells these things. And then they get four inches and six inches and eight inches. And they actually put them on, on, on a wheel, on wheel hose too, the same blade. Um, it's, 
It's wonderful. My, my colleague here, Birgit, who, who gardens with me, um, um, you know, this is the first tool that she reaches for all the time. It really is, it really is a, a, a superlative tool. You want, to get a, you want to get a good one. Some of the American knockoffs are clunky. This particular one is Swiss. Uh, it has a very nice hinge. It's very fast and, and a very nice, very nice tool. Now, you may, you may eschew um, standing up. You may decide in your, in your dotage that it feels good to sit down. And you're happy to sit down and read and then crawl along a little farther and do a little more reading. In which case, I draw your attention to the single greatest gardening tool, the hand hoe. You sometimes notice a Dutch hand hoe. Triangular blade designed so that when you are down on your knees and your arm is extended, the blade is parallel to the ground. If you come across something that's deep rooted like a dandelion, you turn it sideways, you whack it into the ground, you pop out the deep root. But basically, otherwise, it's essentially shaving the surface of the bed. I'm not an expert in shaving, as you can see, but I do it occasionally. You could, if this tool is properly sharpened, shave with it. Comes in left and right handed models. This is made by the Schneebor Company in, in, in Holland. Uh, there's another one called DeWitt. I have up here uh, some handouts that I picked up at the last note reading from the Good Vermont, a good Vermont company known as Howland, Howland Tools, <coughs> Shelburne Falls, Massachusetts, sorry, it's across the border. But they import European gardening tools and you come up and grab one of those afterwards. They said, pass them out, pass them out. So I am. They, uh, but this is a, this is a, this is a beautiful tool. Uh, it's, it's handy for, for so many things. If I had to, again, I had there with a, with a spading fork because it's probably a single most useful tool. Now there are other hand hoes. There's this one. But this one, you notice, has a completely different aspect. This one, this one is not for weeding. This is a planting hoe. And this is, this is one that you thunk into the ground, pull toward you, and put your transplant in. Now, it doesn't work through plastic. If you've laid down plastic on your raised bed, and you need to make a bunch of holes, and you need to make a bunch of holes in a hurry, I mean, you can use scissors, but even neater, you get one of those little propane torches, and you give it to a teenager, yeah. and you walk them down the road. Just Touch that torch to the plastic and you can make a bunch of holes in, in, a, in a wicked hurry and the, the kid is very happy. There's nothing like it. Playing with fire. So these are, these are, these are two very, very different holes. Hole. This is closer to an eye hole. This is like a small eye hole. This is for some of you who go to Army, Navy, surplus and, and get the, uh, the, the trenching tool, you know, that the, they use for digging fox holes. That's functioning the same way. Thump, pull it toward you. So now on the subject of, 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 of coming away from long handled tools, we'll get shorter yet. The trowel. The trowel. At the Victory Garden, <coughs> I, was, I had so little time. I had to teach you everything I knew about planting potatoes. I said, how long else have I got to do this? 45 seconds, he said. I said, Ross, I can't do potatoes in 45 seconds. He said, okay, you have 47. <laughs> Great. So I'd lay out a series of tools, and then I'd start talking. And I have to talk fast. And I invariably forget that I had tools because the soil was so beautifully there, <laughs> because I could drive my arm up to my elbow in those beds. Uh, I, I, tools sat unused. But this is the, the tool. Uh, many of these tools, let's say, like, like the rake, which, which, you know, some people in the morning say, Roger, what did you comb your hair with? You know, a chair leg or something like that. But, but you can comb your hair with your fingers, and you can flatten out the garden with your fingers. And you can dig holes. I mean, I, I can plant <coughs> lettuce with my hand in good soil. But the trowel is better on your nails. Hey, how many of you wear gloves to garden? I've got to tell you that French knights started wearing gloves to distinguish themselves from gardeners. <laughs> and I, I'm a firm believer in, in, except for pruning blackberries in bare hand gardening, because that way you know what the soil temperature is, that way you know what the moisture is. All kinds of things can be determined by the bare hand that you can't determine when you have a glove on. But the, the challenge with the trowel is the vast majority of people dig holes. And, and we, if you allow, if you allow a, a, a perennial example, let me talk about Narcissus for a minute. Because of, you know you buy narcissus one at a time and they cost a buck a piece you know ten narcissus for you know twelve narcissus for ten bucks but you start buying hundred narcissus or five hundred narcissus and the price really goes down it's a whole lot cheaper to buy a whole lot so you buy a whole lot and then you go out and you start digging holes and planting your narcissus one by one and you get you get fifty planted the first day and the next day you plant twenty five but your wrist isn't feeling too good and and then you call me up at the magazine you know. 
five months later and say, look, I got 100 narcissists in the garage still that I didn't get planted, what do I do? The problem was, you were holding your trial like this. Nobody should hold a trial like this. This is not the way trials are held. This is um, the way a trial is held. Is this way. And if it's not comfortable holding the trial like this, you got the wrong trial. The wrist is a very delicate joint that's used for writing fine calligraphy and all kinds of delicate motions. It is not designed for heavy work. Your elbow is designed for heavy work. You grab your trowel like this, and what do you have? You have an eye hook. Ho! Stick it in the ground, pull it. That's, that's how trowels are held. And I'm not making this up, ladies and gentlemen. After I started doing this, somebody came and said, oh God, the old professor so-and-so at Cornell used to throw a trowel out into his class and ask somebody to hold it and tell them they hold it upside down. And it, this one's particularly nice, it's a nice curve to the handle and it fits the hand. Bam, pull it in, pull it like that. Now, if you can't, if you can't do this, if you wham it into the ground and nothing happens, then you need to go back to these other tools and do a little stirring of the ground and soften things up a little bit so that your planting, your planting makes sense. But, Got that? Not this way. And people keep passing out decorative trowels, you know, and for, for ceremonial trowels and that. They're, they're pretty to look at. But you might as well drill a hole through them and hang them on the wall for decoration because they're no doubt good for actual, actual digging. OK, we're almost done. What time do you think, Gordon? Five minutes. Oh, heck, no problem. Piece of cake. I'm on schedule. So, um, Two things that we take into the garden are with us that are perhaps more relevant to, to woodies and perennials than vegetables, but believe me, we always carry them with us because they're always useful. And the first is a pair of pruning shears. And there are lots of different pruners out there, the big distinction between bypass pruners and, and anvil pruners. Anvil pruners are cheap, and the ratchet anvil pruners are the cheapest of all. You go crank, 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 and it cuts the dead roots stick just fine. If it's green wood, you want bypass shears, and you want to buy good bypass shears, and I'm talking about buying the very best. Everybody know what these are? Velcro. Velcro's, exactly, Swiss made. Maybe they're not the best pruning shears on the planet, but they are very, very good, and they are very, very expensive. But they come in different sizes and different shapes. And most of us, I have spent my life persuading people that in the case of Velcro, you need Velcro number six. If you read about Velcro number six, it's made for the smaller hand. The fact of the matter is, ladies and gentlemen, a hand in full extension is quite weak. And if you compare the Falcon number six to the Falcon number eight, you'll see that the Falcon number eight open up considerably farther than the Falcon number sixes. Yes, sixes have smaller blades than eights, but my rule of thumb is, if it's bigger than your thumb, you're not cutting it with pruning shears. You're cutting it with a saw. But treat yourself to a pair of really fine, and do not, do not, I repeat, do not, Lend. <laughs> Lend your new Falcos to anybody else. They will use it to cut wire. <laughs> I don't come back. I mean, you, 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 you load your shovel with somebody, and it comes back, and he put tape around it because there's a small crack in the handle, but they fixed it with tape. The rule of thumb is that if it's bigger than your thumb, you go to a saw, and it's in it. these are fantastic saws. I think there's only one company making the blades. The blades are sharpened. It cuts primarily on the pull stroke, but each blade is sharpened on three sides. And uh, buy yourself a new one of these every year. I use it for everything from cutting baling twine to, to garden stakes, you know, in the garden. You, and, and I, I use I, I, tomato weave, but I don't buy proper stakes. I cut young trees down and adjust them to the ground. When you put them in the ground by taking a crowbar and making a hole and then stick the stick up. Don't try to pound the stick in the ground. Um, these, are, these are fantastic. This is the most dangerous tool I've, I've showed you today. This one will hurt you. This, um, this tool does not distinguish between limbs and limbs, which is to say you can cut yourself badly. So, so perhaps the best stroke is that, that of fencers who keep one hand behind their back as they, as they parry and advance and this and that. But, but one of these, it, fit, it folds up neatly, it fits in your pocket. It's a six-inch blade. A six-inch blade will cut down a six-inch tree just fine. You don't need, you don't need, you don't need a bigger blade. Now, all of these tools are are top of the line. As I say, the whole set costs you three hundred dollars. Um, when you have them, take care of them. People are always always asking me, you know, 
What do you do? What do you do about how do you how do you keep your handles? You know, do you do you do you sand them and put on linseed oil and this and that? And I said, you know, no, no. In my experience, using them keeps them sufficiently oiled. And I guess if you if you are really worried about that, you can take off your glasses and rub them outside your nose the way the way the pipe smokers do to their pipes to keep their pipes lightly oiled. Um, the secret, of course, is to bring your shovel in when you're finished with it at the end of the day. The, the handles are getting all fuzzy, or the ones they've left out for the winter are now lost are peeling small strips of wood off the handles. <laughs> Just bring the tool in, clean off the mud. Do not do what Martha Stewart tells you to do, which is to take, take a bucket of sand and add motor oil, use motor oil to it, and then oh. clean your tool. I mean, you take her viewership, and you have the Exxon Valdez oil spill all over again. <laughs> if you insist on using oil and sand, use extra virgin olive oil. It's just very always recommended, OK? But most importantly, most importantly, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to think of your tools as the following. I want you, it's so easy to be generous. I mean, not just with zucchini, but with everything, with knowledge, all sorts of things. But do not be generous with your tools. Your tools are an extension. You spent years looking for the right one. It's an extension of your, your body, not to mention your need and your gender and everything else. And so the analogy that I like to make is to remember what it was like when you're dating. And you go out on a date. Somebody sets you up on a date. And you go out on the date. And, and it turns out to be way better, way, way better than you ever thought it was going to be. And the evening just goes by in a blur. And all of a sudden, it's later. A snowstorm has come. And it's clear that you're not going to get home. And you've been invited to spend the night, if not in the same bed, at least on the couch. But the trouble is, you've got to go to bed, and you didn't pack anything and you really don't like to go to bed with a fuzzy mouth. So you need to brush your teeth. So you say to the person in question, could I borrow, could I borrow your toothbrush? <laughs> <laughs> I have often heard some poor woman in the audience, if it's a larger audience, go, no! <laughs> yes, exactly. We don't share too which seems a little bit odd, because at this point in the evening, or the, or the, you would think that you might have shared things that were perhaps just as intimate as the toothbrush. But there's something about toothbrushes that somehow are personified as, as individual. I want you to think that way about your tools. You know, be generous in all other things, but do not be generous with your tools. Somebody says, can I borrow a shovel? You say, no, but I, I will drive you down to the hardware store and show you how to pick out a good one. Or uh, I have a catalog here, the have catalog, and we'll look it up, and we'll order you a great one. That is my Christmas present to you. Okay. Gardening has been described variously as the, the slowest of the performing arts, <laughs> or the most ephemeral. And there are very few gardens. The garden conservancy aside, there are very few gardens that outlast their gardeners. But the tools, these tools, cared for and loved, will be there for the next generation. They, they, they will, they will in, their, in their age and in their usage, um, be testament to what has gone before. Thank you. Come up afterwards and cut yourself on any sharp tool you want. <laughs> I'm not providing insurance. No, it, it, it really, you know, I'm talking home gardens. I'm not talking 30 acres of vegetables. I'm talking, you know, uh, uh, the average, the average, uh, the typical home garden is only 75 square feet. Make that two or three times that size. Do a, do a bed that's, that's 20, 20 by 40, you know, 800 square feet. And you can raise an astonishing quantity of food. You know, there, there are challenges in, in harvesting, there are issues of uh, storage, and this and that. But um, it, 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 as we pointed out, these plants want to grow. It's not hard. But you do need to be there. I mean, there's no substitute for the garden of shadow. A domestic plant cannot take care of itself. It's entered into a partnership with the domesticator, that is us, to provide defense, to provide extra fertilizer and water, and because it's relinquish seed dormancy mechanisms and tough fiber and spines and secondary chemicals. It, it, the two of us together, the plant and the gardener, will go into the future together. Um, but we need to be involved. There's no such thing as low maintenance vegetable gardening that ever will be. And don't do it if you don't enjoy the process. Because, but these tools behind me are the ones that make the task a whole lot easier, wonderfully quiet, and 
as I say, they're self-starting. Thanks. Can I ask a question? You can ask all sorts of questions. Can we thought we, we're going to start the uh, Q&A now. John is going to have to get a couple chairs. So um, we'll, we'll wait until John comes up. Okay. We'll, we'll get the chairs. Give me a hand. I'll just show you the shovel. Uh, that's not an exciting sharpening. One, one bell is enough. So what was the question? Sharpening How the sharpener to show? We use the same tool and you do one bell. Okay, you do one bell. One bell. You don't need to do both bells. Okay. Just one bell. It doesn't really matter which bell it is. But, but have a feel. This is, this is a nice level. This is a nice level of sharpening. Booyah wow. Booyah wow. Booyah wow. Can you do the same thing with a push lawnmower? It's quite sharp. Um, yes, one more blade, one more blade. Actually, when I was growing up, there was a sporting goods store that sharpened skates for the Bruins and other, and other skaters. And it did, it did figure skates and hockey skates all went along and used the same machines to sharpen uh, more blades all summer long. Uh, but generally speaking, those are not sharpened by hand, they're sharpened with a, with a bench grinder. Yeah. So a shovel, just one side at one time. One side, one side. It doesn't matter which side it is. Okay. I would sharpen the inside, but you want to sharpen the outside. More or less, just look what the factory did and, and continue on that. You were talking about the, the, the bad bugs you get in the gardens, the aphids and the, uh, the drips and other things. And you talked about good bugs that will come by and eat them. Yep. How do you attract, and what plants do you use to attract? You use plants to get the good bugs into well, your... Yeah, that's a, a, a developing science, but actually there's uh, a lot of greenhouse growers and uh, gardeners uh, that are, are getting into that. There's two, two types of plants, really, that we, we use in the greenhouse. One is called, a, and actually, I plant, I've planted marigolds already. That's kind of crazy, isn't it? Because they'll be ready around mid-March and they'll just get frosted. But we use the marigolds as what we call trap plants. And so we put those in little containers and we place them throughout the greenhouse. And they're the, really the only thing blossoming and they're yellow and the scent is attracting uh, the bad bugs to them. And then when we get our good bugs in, we sprinkle them on the marigolds and they have a, a buffet uh, lunch. The other uh, plant that... So, so, the, so the, the marigolds are attracting the bad bugs? They're, well, they're attracting all the bugs, really, because uh, of the scent and the yellow color. You know, so right. they're getting bugs. To, they're getting bugs together. It's like uh, e harmony for bugs. Okay. You know, so <laughs> what we get. The next thing we do is we use what we call banker plants, and banker plants are little breeding grounds for our 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 good bugs. But do you buy the good bugs? Yes. He buys the good. You bugs. can buy the good bugs, but there are because we buy the good bugs because it's winter or it's cold. Yeah. But there are good bugs all around um, your fields and your gardens, and so you can attract those good bugs um, to help fight the bad bugs by planting uh, alyssum is a great draw, uh, and a lot of uh, farms and uh, uh, greenhouses will plant that around the perimeter of their garden. Uh, it's more and more common now to, to trap, to uh, draw bugs. And oh, this is an annual? Perennial? Yes, it's a, a very a highly scented uh, uh, annual. Yeah. He also, um, Queen Anne's lace, a member of the carrot family, is an important food source for the adults of a number of parasitic wasps. They're actually parasitoids in that they actually kill the young. If you, if you see a tomato hornworm and the tomato hornworm has what looks like little eggs on the back of it, those are actually the, cat, the cocoons of the braconid wasp. And the adult pecan of wasp will nectar on on things like Queen Anne's lace. So don't don't rush to to clean up your hedgerows of of uh, basically wild carrot. And don't throw out a parasitized hornworm. Right. Because that is a, about a to hatch. breeding ground. And if you if you know if you raise tomatoes, you've probably seen a hornworm, and you think you've uh, traveled somewhere back into prehistoric times. And uh, if you hear a loud crunching at night that wakes you up, that's the hornworm in your tomatoes. <laughs> and their their maws look like low-flying aircraft. <laughs> you know, they're set, they're have a wingspan of about five or six inches. And and, and and I talk about the gardener's shadow. There is there is no substitute for the right timing. Bacillus thuringiensis is useless as a control by the time the hornworm is as big as a cigar butt. Um, it, 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 the dose makes the poison, but in the first and second instar, shortly after the egg has happened, B. 
BT works great, which means in, in my place in New Hampshire, I spray the first and second week in July, and I never see a tomato hornworm because they, 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 they die. I, never, I could never find them, but they are there. Next question. Do you have a good source of, um, for manure or compost that, that you can get in small I mean, I don't mean I have a small garden, so I don't need a truckload, but for a small amount. Uh, lo locally? Locally. Yeah. Um, you know, there used to be March construction used to handle all of that yeah. locally. Uh, right now, it's pretty much going to your local dairy farmer. Okay. If, if you need small amounts, the moodoo is, is tremendous, uh, compost and cow manure. Uh, it doesn't have a lot of uh, nitrogen or fertilizer in it, but it does have a lot of, of organic matter, mm -hmm. and, and it's good. But it's, it's, it's establishing a relationship with your local dairy farmer <laughs> is the best bet. Yeah. Not, not to put too fine a point on it, but, but the, 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 one, the one bone I have to pick with the organic movement is their, their complete and absolute embargoing of human waste in organic agriculture. It's been, it's been banned. And whether you call it biosolids or sewage sludge or whatever, we all produce it. And if we cannot return the nutrients from our own meals to the land from which our food comes, we can't really truly call ourselves organic. And there are, I refer you to a wonderful book called The Human Newer Handbook about the, uh, the, the, the high temperature composting of human waste. Uh, I myself uh, grew up with a, with a Clivus Moltrum composting toilet. I wouldn't spread the, the compost on the lettuce plants before I was going to serve them, but, 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 but it's very nice to know that it's not being flushed out into the bay. Um, and, and that really is an issue, and, and yes, it needs to be, it need, you need to know that it's clean, but, but the heavy metals in the, what I produce are very small indeed. And so that is, is, a, is a resource. So people keep saying, what's your favorite fertilizer, Roger? And I say, the stuff I make. <laughs> and there is a form called Milorganite, which you probably which know about. Milwaukee. Which also right. has a yeah. deer resistant right. quality to right. it. Deer will smell it. You can tell it works smell. by the smell. Milorganite. And historically, it was contaminated with cadmium and, yeah. and, and metals from, from, from machine shops in Milwaukee, but they have cleaned it up because the Milwaukee Sewage Street Com Commission is part of the city of Milwaukee's governance, and, and they basically went around from shop to shop, tested the water, and if it was polluted, they fined them. If the fines didn't work, the director said to me, on several occasions, we backed a truck and ready mix up and poured it right into their drains. Yes. Uh, okay. uh, I have a question about earthworms. I know they're really promoted as a as an indicator. You've got good soil, but I also know I've seen articles on earthworms are going to really take destroy our soil structure, particularly where you're near trees and your forest. I think so. That's a that's a very good question. And then the answer is, you're right and you're right, which is the glacier did not leave us with earthworms. And fishermen who discard their earthworms at the edges of ponds because they're finished fishing, those earthworms are devastating the native vegetation in the forest next to the pond. How? They're churning, they're churning, they're churning the soil. They're churning the soil. I have a, a plot of land, it's not a plot, it's like a four by five area enclosed with cement, and it's in Connecticut, and I think it's got the, the wigglers, and that soil is all granulated. I couldn't figure out what this was going on there, but I think I have the wiggler worms in there, and it's not really soil. Yeah, hmm? yeah uh, you know, a, a few earthworms are a, a good indicator of soil health. Um, your soil is alive, but I, I'm I haven't experienced it because we're dealing with you know 30 acres, uh, but when you look at sometimes my grandfather's old manure uh, compost pile, which is just loaded with them, yeah, I don't think I'd want to put roots in into that type of soil. So the ideal thing is for you to dish out some of those worms and sell them to your neighbors. Or go fishing. Or go fishing. Yes, sir, you had a question. Yes. And when we were watching the slides there, uh, I was giving the slides, 
that you show the tomato leaves, they were picking them off on the lower part of the, uh, do you fellows, rec you guys recommend just picking the leaves off the right. bottoms? And does that affect the uh, yeah. nutrients that the no, tomatoes what, are going to produce? The, the leaves that are underneath the, the, the fruit set are totally unnecessary. Once the set, once the fruit set, and, and is growing, all the lower leaves are completely oh, unnecessary, especially after oh. you pick the tomatoes. Yeah. So I recommend, after you pick the tomatoes, strip the leaves, okay? okay. And later in the season, as, as uh, if the disease pressure is high, I would like strip almost all the leaves. Yep. Oh, it's okay. it's, just it's the funny, it's, uh, it's really weird. I learned, and it took me uh, actually a while to realize this, but uh, one year we had greenhouse tomatoes, and we have these little irrigation timers and it got stuck on. And so it just uh, flooded the, the greenhouse. It was, the soil was very damp. And then it rained for like three days. And so we had uh, edema, which is like poison ivy, on the leaves of the tomato plants. And the tomatoes uh, were set up pretty good. They just about start, were starting to turn red. And I lost just about every leaf on those tomato plants. And I was like, oh my God, you know. I just ruined my tomato crop. I had the biggest and the best tomatoes I've ever had because all the nutrient went into the tomato instead of the leaf. And uh, it was just remarkable. And so tomato growers now, especially I showed you those slides of grafted tomatoes, they want to produce a lot of vegetation and foliage. And, the, and we're advised now to take off leaves even above the fruiting. Um, to let air circulation in and to keep that nutrient and growth going towards the fruit and not to the foliage. If you'll, if you'll, if you'll allow me a, a moment of plant physiology here in sure. competition, uh, the, the pea plant can produce a full crop of peas without any leaves whatsoever. But the function of leaves in a pea plant are to shade out competitors. And, the, and, and so there is a, you, you can remove, you know, 15% uh, of the leaves on a potato plant have no effect on tuber development whatsoever because the, the, the plant has extra, has extra leaves. The, the risk to leaving old foliage on a tomato plant is that when disease gets into that leaf, that is the inoculum for the next leaf up and, and it, will spread, it will spread fast. So my rule of thumb is that any time a leaf begins to look a little tired, it goes away. Uh, just clip it off. Just, just, just snap it right off, and 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 dispose of it, not 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 nearby, compost, not, yeah. not nearby, not compost, yeah. compost because the oh, the spores of of most of the common leaf diseases overwinter on the foliage. Now that's not true for late blight, but 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 for septoria leaf spot and things like that, bacterial spot overwinters on the leaves. Now that you brought up the blight, does that prevent the blight, help the the tomato plant from not getting the blight if they don't have the, the bottom leaves there to for the soil to splash up onto the, I, how was that, did that yeah, help? I don't think so, I think the spores are airborne. Yeah, late blight comes yeah. in on, on thunderstorms from the south. Yeah. It oh. does not overwinter here in New England and it blows up and, and every extension service puts out bulletins you can get on the mailing list and they'll tell you when it showed up in your county and, and at that point you either need to start fighting copper or, or some other right. spray yeah. because it, it's different, it's, it's not so airborne, it comes okay. in on the wind. And, and the spores can land right on the fruit. It doesn't have to be, it doesn't start at the leaf. So you can have no leaves and you'll still get late blight. Oh, yes. The spores will land where they land and they'll do their spory thing. Uh, the I was under the impression they came from the, from the dirt. When it rained, I thought they dirt. came from the dirt too. I had not, not, late, not, late, not late blight. Not yeah. late blight. Yeah. But other blight, I had read once. Other blight, yes, other blight, yes, but not late blight. That, that one of the reasons that it's good to mulch tomatoes right. is because otherwise the rain hits right. the dirt and sprays it's up. Prophylactic yeah. coating of the soil. It's yeah. a good thing to do. And is is uh, is like the plastic uh, uh, mulch better than straw or something like it's that? It's warmer. And remember that that that, that the plants, particularly tropical plants like the tomato, like warmth. So it's a hot mulch. And so yes, plastic is better than straw. If you're going to use straw, don't put it on too early. And those people who say, oh, I started my tomatoes too early and they're about three feet high, so I'm going to dig a real deep hole and I'm going to plant my tomato and I'm going to backfill it because it'll make roots all along the stem. Well, yeah, but you put the, the root ball down two feet and you know it's still 45 degrees down there and nothing happens for the next three weeks. Yeah, better, better to lay them horizontally. Exactly, better to lay them horizontally. If you have to do that, better to wait until eight weeks before you plant, plant out until you can sow your tomatoes because a six-inch transplant is a lovely transplant. Well, that, that's the, uh, probably the major question we get in the garden center is 
Uh, my tomatoes got late, late blight, and um, they're devastated now. And this uh, past year in our neck of the woods was particularly bad for blight with all the wet weather we had. So you have to remember that uh, copper and uh, most of the other uh, chemical fungicides are prophylactic methods and not curative uh, methods. So you need to get that copper on there, ideally uh, um, before a wet period, um, so that when the spores are in the air and attacking the plant, they hit that copper and they burn. That's because once they get established. I have found that you can stop uh, late blight if you hit it early enough, you can contain it. The copper will help contain it on the plant. It won't, if you, it, it, can, it can devastate a plant in three or four days, but if you have some copper on there, you can slow it down and uh, sometimes go for weeks. And for those of you who are planting tomatoes by the hundreds in long lines, there's a lot to be said for inserting fire breaks in your rows so that it doesn't get in and race down the row endlessly. There's a little, a little, air, a little air gap. And the proper way to apply the copper, to spray it from underneath, uh, put it on, on a spray it on top, you know, of the, the leaf, or do I put it under, uh, spray it on the ground so it gets soaked up into the roots and up into the... Uh, no, it's not a systemic copper. Uh, you, the ideal thing would be to have a power enough sprayer that would yeah. flip the leaves over and get top and bottom, get coverage. Okay, so you, 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 I, I want to get that copper underneath the leaves and on yeah. top of the leaves. But yes. I mean, if you can if you can rotate the location of your tomatoes as well, yeah. that's pretty. Yeah, good. we we do from from one edge of the garden, which is only only thirty feet. From this thirty. Yeah, feet. But that's that's, that's, why, it's rotation. So, but that's that why it's so difficult for home gardeners because yeah. your um, rotation options, 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 options are so limited. limited. It's not like us; we have like an acre here, <laughs> <and they're laughs> four acres yeah. away. We do, you know what I mean? Yeah. So, yeah, it's tricky yeah. with the home garden where you have a limited soil. Mm -hmm. But Janet, you have a question? I did. I have a couple of questions for Jack. Um, do you save your seeds at all? You talk about buying seeds in the winter. Do you save your seeds, your plant seeds, for well, the next season? Uh, most, many of the seeds we use are hybrids, so we're unable to save those seeds because they won't come true the next year. They're uh, you know, a cross between two other varieties. and. It's, uh, God knows what you get sometimes if you plant the seeds of a hybrid. On um, some of the heirloom uh, varieties, we do save the seeds uh, because they're open pollinated. Tomatoes are an interesting plant in they tend to self-pollinate rather than cross-pollinate. The exceptions being are the potato-leaved tomatoes. And the potato-leaved tomatoes um, uh, do cross-pollinate, so uh, isolation is required. But if you get a copy of Seed to Seed by Suzanne Ashworth, published by the Seed Savers Exchange, a superb book on saving seeds of absolutely every vegetable out there. And it's the definitive, it's the definitive work. I think there's a second or third edition now. Seed to Seed by Suzanne Ashworth. And she will lay out the whole protocol for saving your own tomato seeds. But in general, it's not a stupid thing to do. If you're going an open pollinated variety that is not a, it is not a brandywine or other potato leaf type, you can save your own seeds with reasonable purity. Yeah. That, and that, to me, is a, has been the, worth the price of admission, just learning that. Because I buy a particular seed called black brandywine. And consistently every year, there's half potato seed and half uh, half potato leaf and half regular leaf plants. And I'm always wondering what the heck is going on here. You know, but that's because the the grower didn't isolate them and they cross pollinate. I also wanted to ask you on a different subject. You talked about growing sweet potatoes. Are you actually growing sweet potatoes or yams? No. Ah. Well, if we were growing yams, it would be for a large African population. Uh, yams and sweet potatoes are a uh, different um, animal altogether. But technically speaking, they are, except that the, the Arkansas or Alabama sweet potato board decided to name yellow orange flesh sweet potatoes yams and yeah. has confused people ever since. Yeah. Okay? Yams, yeah. yams are, true yams are in the family Dioscoriaceae yeah. for which your first birth control pills came. Okay? <laughs> and, and there are new world yams and old world yams but it's a great big different great massive tuber that doesn't look anything like a sweet potato. Yeah. 
Okay. So that what the co-op sells, the red garnet and the jewel, are actually all potatoes. sweet potatoes. Sweet perfectly good. But they're labeled jams. There are white oh, sweet potatoes. Oh, there are red sweet potatoes. There are orange and yellow sweet potatoes. They are all sweet potatoes, and they are all the Morning Glory family, a completely different family from the yam family. Okay. And so damn the board for doing that. Yeah. <laughs> but that's that's caused confusion ever since. Yeah. Yes. So, so Howard, thank you for all of the incredible work that you're doing in these other countries. It seems like it's invaluable because you're doing that story about the Nepalese man who was able to get married. I love that. Yeah, yeah. So, so just thinking about the work that you've done and what a huge contribution you've done to these cultures, what's, what's the big takeaway that you have from this? What have you learned from doing this kind of work? And what have you been able to take back to inform what you do as a, as a part of um, A word of caution. Western, you know, you go there with Western preconceptions of what you're going to do to help these people, you know. Um, and I wonder, you know, I see beautiful cultures and I worry and wonder of the changes we're bringing, okay. Basically, we're bringing a very materialistic view of the world to a culture that for thousands of years has been uh, not materialistic. All right, and we think we have the better way. And I've, I've, I've realized we don't have a better way. We have an easier way, all right? We're not better. We have an easier way of life here. And it's very simplistic to say, oh, we're gonna help these poor people. And I've referred to, and really I shouldn't, you know, the people are poor. Yes, they are poor. They have $300, you know, a year in income. But on the other hand, their needs are small. So what are we trying to do? So I caution that. My main concern, one, is with children and that and there's enough food. So that's my, my main concern and, and health. And, and the countries, there's not any, there's no health system per se, especially in Myanmar. I think they spend $13 a year for a citizen on health care, which is about the lowest in the world. I mean, you know, a couple of boxes of Band-Aids and Rite Aid and a bottle of aspirin, we've spent that. So that's you know what I, what I like to focus on, and economic uh, development as long as it's in the content of what works without overwhelming the society. But that's only my point of view. You go there and you're meeting traders and you, the government they want to expand the you know the, the economy and go into exports and this and that. And you know you got to do what the host asks. You know the assignment is what the assignment is. But I, I try to. Um, and the other takeaway is all farmers all over the world are pretty much the same, all right? That they'll all complain about the, the, <laughs> the weeds. Every country has their own damn weed, or you know, their insect, or they'll complain about the neighbors. I mean, you know, the country next door that's killing the market. Everybody complains about the same thing. But basically, they all want the same thing. They just want to have a better life for them and their families. And they want to have a good crop, whatever it is they're growing, you know? So in one way, we're all the same, you know? So that was my, my takeaway. Thanks. Any other questions? Thank you so much. Well, I just for this second half minute. You, you got one? Uh, yes. I'm sometimes confused between blood meal and bone meal, and what are they for? And I, I don't use them. I don't know whether it's for flowers or whether it's for vegetables or what. Because what's the blood meal and bone meal? Which ones? Do I use for one and one do I use for Well, blood meals for, you know, uh, you can use it for flowers and vegetables and it's nitrogen. Okay. And, and bone meal is uh, phosphorus. So you have three essential ingredients in your fertilizer. Right, right, right. Okay. okay. You know, nitrogen, that's phosphorus, right. and potash. Yeah. You have, you have your wood stove, that supplies all the potash you need. And is blood meal blood? Yeah. Just dry dry blood. blood. Dry blood. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Probably. And you got to be careful with it. It's powerful. Uh-huh. It's very expensive, but it's 12% nitrogen, so it's very effective, and yeah, the, goes, the, the bone little meal, little goes The bone right. meal is, <laughs> is, is slow to break down and slow to provide any benefit. It's sort of like rock phosphate. There's nothing wrong with it, but actually our soils, at least on my side of the Connecticut River, have a lot of phosphorus already. And you want to be careful about adding too much phosphorus. If you, those of you who are adding manure to your beds in a big way, 
are increasing the phosphorus level. And there will come a time when the EPA will step in and say, phosphorus runoff from your fields is a problem. And this is a problem for organic gardeners. Yeah. You've got to watch your they, phosphorus levels. They're, they've stepped in already to do that in uh, Vermont. It's a big issue now because of the lakes, especially like Champlain and the streams. So yeah, that's an issue already. And, and, and it's going to get tighter. And if you step in manure, you want to change your boots before you go in the house. <laughs> Thank you. That's why I'm here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.